let's just pray and then we're just going to allow Martin to, to share what God's laid on his heart and I know it's been a, a struggle this week in that way but we know God is in the midst of all this so let's just let's just lift up the Lord and, and lift up Martin and just pray anointing to flow and to fall upon us all this this day Lord Jesus we thank you for who you are we thank you for your majesty for your authority for your blessings to us that which are, are real this day which are poured out upon us anew and Lord, we thank you for the evidence of anointing that we've already seen today, Lord. The anointing you've been pouring upon our young people as they've been leading us in worship, in praise, and, and in the word, Lord. They've just been opening their hearts to you. And Lord, we just thank you for that anointing that is flowing already this day. And Lord, we just want to pray for an increase of that anointing upon our lives, upon our families, upon our homes, upon, upon us, Lord. That we may be the anointed of the Lord, carrying forth your word into our world and Lord I just want to pray an outpouring of your Holy Spirit over the whole church wherever we are Lord that you will just draw us deeper into you that there will be a real anointing of your spirit flowing in our homes in our families this day and that we will know your presence in a way that we've never experienced before Lord, I ask that you'll just bless us, draw us deeper into you, Lord. Draw us into your inner life, that your spirit may flow and break out of us in ways that we have never conceived imaginable. Lord, I pray now, just your power and your spirit to flow upon us. And Lord, we want to lift up Martin and, and Cheryl and here before you, Lord. We just want to pray your spirit over them, Lord, right now. And especially Martin, that you'll just anoint his words. That the words he shares this morning, Lord, will be your words. Lord, he's been wrestling with him over the, the week. And I just know, Lord, he's had to battle through things. But Lord, I thank you that you are the one who overcomes. And Lord, that you've been upholding him and sustaining him in this week. And Lord, I just pray for him, for the whole family, that you will just protect them. You will watch over them. You will guard them. And Lord, just let your anointing flow into that family today. That they will just feel your presence in a very intimate and close way. And Lord, I just thank you for Martin. I thank you for the work that he does. I thank you for his faithfulness to you. And I just ask, Lord, that as he shares this morning, you will just, and just pour your spirit upon him and just touch his lips, that he will be able to speak your words with fluency, with eloquency, but also, Lord, that you will just in, interject whatever you want to have spoken, that the words he shares will be your words, and that you will put in his heart and mind what you want to convey. Lord, we ask this now for the glory and for the praise of your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I can say good morning, everybody, because the word is started before 12 o'clock. So well done to the team. Well done to Charmaine. Well done to everybody uh, who's participated this morning. It's a privilege to be able to teach um, this morning and to be able to serve the Lord like this. Uh, Please let me know if the sound is not working on the chat or something else like that as quickly as you can so that we can really get into this. <clears throat> First of all, uh, thank you to Faith for reading from 1 John 2. We will be getting there quite soon. So if you have got your scripture with you, got your Bible with you, uh, please uh, find 1 John chapter 2 towards the end of the Bible. Uh, John's second Catholic letter, general letter uh, of encouragement and direction that we're going to have need some really important points out of that. But overall, today I want to be teaching about anointing. This is something that's very important for uh, the leadership at the moment. It's a very practical um, thing that we need to discuss and understand within the church. Um, but it can also be one of those church words that we use in church that we never use anywhere else. And people say anointing this, anointing this, anointing this, anointed this. But what does it really mean? So let's get that sorted. Let's get that straight today. Uh, the first thing I want everybody listening today, and I'm really pleased that uh, so many young people have participated because this is also a teaching I really want the young people of River Church to grasp. And anybody else who feels young in their faith, or uh, that should be most of us, uh, or anybody else listening or watching the recording of this, I want us to grasp this thing first um, of all. What does it mean, anointing? What is an anointing? What is the anointing? If we can get that straight, uh, we can receive anointing a lot more clearly. And we can also discern, understand anointing a lot, more, a lot more clearly. So that's number one. I want us to know 
what is anointing and then there are three words the lord has given me about the anointing of god okay you might even want to write these down uh, i don't see that pastor dave has got his notebook in front of him but i'm sure that's because mel is about to bring it to him and make his bible notes we don't do a lot of, of note teaching and stuff like that in in our church but i hope that these three words are going to stick with you so if you want to write them down and chew over them over the next week it might really help you you might just say oh yeah what was that thing that martin said or the holy spirit said through martin and, and it might be something that prompts you okay <clears throat> here we go i mean you can tell it's holy spirit because it even makes a pattern i feel i felt quite welsh when the lord gave me this i felt like this was a welsh way of preaching first god's anointing is relational okay everybody god's anointing is relational second god's anointing is purposeful and third god's anointing is powerful so we've got three words there for you about god's anointing it's relational it's purposeful and it's powerful Thank you, Suze, for putting some uh, notes here on the chat. So Suze is going to be note taker for all of us. But this is what the Holy Spirit has been impressing on my heart. And I think what's really important. So I'm not going to faff around any longer. I mean, to get straight into this and, and bring you some, some direct teaching. First of all, what is anointing? Now, anointing is a church word that we hear around. And we often use it in a metaphorical or a slightly spiritual term. We say, oh, he's got anointing. That was anointed worship. I mean, even today... A little thing popped up on our chat during our service. One of our church members said, oh, such anointed worship. And you could be in church for a very long time and never really understand that word, what it means. In Old Testament times and in New Testament times, anointing was a lot more common now as an idea and a phrase because it's when you dress something, when you smear something with, with oil usually oil, sometimes another substance, occasionally water or blood for different reasons. But it's when you take some, some oil and you pour it either liberally or you stroke it, whatever, and different uh, parts of the church still practice this quite regularly. We actually use anointing oil, particularly when we think about healing. And the word anoint simply means to put ointment, to put oil on something. I mean, nowadays we do that. Uh, ladies do that for their faces to keep their skin fresh they put on face creams and things like that gentlemen might put something in their beard if they want to go out to a party and smell really nice they might anoint themselves and when we think about that in terms of simply a down-to-earth way of using lotions to make yourself beautiful or to enjoy it or to celebrate that's an idea we're a little bit more familiar with but how does that relate to this idea that we use in church of anointed worship anointed speaker it doesn't mean that somebody smells nice it doesn't mean that somebody's got oil on their beard or does it so let's come back to that that's the, that's the literal meaning anointing and in old testament times people in israel were commanded by god to anoint things and anoint people in very specific ways okay <clears throat> so one example is when moses was given the law of god and he was given the, all the law about how the temple worship should be done and how the tabernacle was to be built. God told him, I want you to anoint the temple, the tabernacle, the poles, the curtains, the brass rings, the great big bronze bath, the, the sea, the altar. God even gave a particular recipe for what sort of oil Moses should use. And he wanted Aaron, the chief priest, and all the Levites under him to be anointed so god was saying very specifically i want you to take some oil like this like this like this and put it on these things okay now that was one way that those objects and those people the whole levitical family the whole family of levi of which aaron was the head at that time were marked as special to the lord holy to the lord okay now we think about things being holy to the lord in uh, ancient Israel it was very very clear what was holy to the Lord very clear um, the whole tribe of Levi didn't work in the way that we know work they received things to them it was like a Sabbath family and if you were born to that family you weren't lucky you never had to do any work your work was holy unto the Lord and you were anointed for it from quite a young age and when people came to minister in the temple they were anointed oil was poured on them in quite a lavish way special oil other people were anointed in the old testament times 
Uh, you might know the story of, of Samuel anointing first Saul, taking his horn of oil and pouring it on Saul, and anointing David after that. Uh, like our own David, who's been anointed by the Holy Spirit, uh, David, the king of Israel, was anointed by Samuel, had oil poured on him. It marked him as special in the land, special unto the Lord, that God was going to do something with this king. Prophets were also anointed. So we've got priests prophets and kings were anointed in the old testament now there was um some some very real spiritual things going on but this is also a very practical thing there was oil that was kept for it in the temple and it was used in that sort of way and there's a bit of us as uh, modern kind of rational christians who think well well why does all this oil stuff matter isn't that just superstition it's not superstition to use oil in this way, as long as you don't suddenly become a believer in the oil instead of a believer in God who gave these commands. Because God doesn't think that olive oil or truffle oil or rapeseed oil or vegetable oil by itself is going to mark things as special. You are probably aware that in scripture, the oil is a very very clear metaphor a very clear symbol of the holy spirit of god and where scripture talks about oil being poured out and where the oil marks king david and king saul and all the presence of uh, the temple and the the tabernacle this is about the presence of the holy spirit of god resting on and ministering through those people and things Okay, a little bit of an accident over there with a, with a very strong daughter. Let's just make sure those sounds aren't going on there. All right. Um, the Holy Spirit is represented by the oil in Scripture. One person beyond all others should spring to mind when we think about anointing. Okay? One person is the perfect example of purposeful anointing powerful anointing relational anointing there's one person who is the best example of the priest anointed the prophet anointed and the king anointed and i bet you should be able to guess his name if you've ever been to sunday school the answer is always jesus is jesus i can see charmaine mouthing it there jesus is the example and I just want to make this completely clear. This may, you may have got away without realizing this. Jesus' full name, as we talk about in church, is Jesus Christ. Or Jesus the Messiah. And that word Christ, which is a Greek word, literally means anointed. It means Jesus, the person who has been chosen and marked with oil by God. The word Messiah means Jesus, the ch person who has been chosen and marked by oil, by God. Now we know that oil really means the Holy Spirit. The reason that God asked people to put oil on things was to show that that was where he wanted to pour out his Holy Spirit. And the one place that God really, really wanted to show his Holy Spirit living in man and in working in power, in relationship and in purpose is jesus christ true then true now jesus christ the anointed one the chosen one the one full of the holy spirit when jesus went to the temple the synagogue in capernaum which is related in the story of luke 4 and he opened the scroll I just love this bit if i start crying really forgive me uh, he opened up the scroll and it says that he found the place of, of uh, in Isaiah where it is written. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He said to the people today in your hearing, this scripture is fulfilled. And then he taught. That is the same passage that has inspired Dave to grasp at a new vision for river church and for all of us for this is uh, and and going back to what uh, the lord spoke through isaiah prophetically there's a picture there 
of the way that God wants to work through us, through Jesus and through you individually to bring about his kingdom on earth and in the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus, when he took that moment, he opened up Isaiah and read from Isaiah chapter 61. He was claiming to be anointed. He was saying these words apply to me right now. Now that was controversial. That's one of the reasons that later people upset because Jesus was very publicly saying, I am the Messiah you're looking for. The word in Hebrew is even Masa, anointed me. Jesus saying, I am the Messiah. In Greek, it's even closer for us because in the Greek translation of that, which was around at that time, the word is Krise. Jesus was saying, I am Krise. I'm anointed. I'm the Christ. Now that really is the underpinning of our vision for River Church. That's the underpinning of what the Holy Spirit himself has been leading us to say. When we were discussing his leadership, there was something about this phrase anointed that we needed to keep. However much we thought about other things, anointed is really what God wants us to say. He wants us to recognize our anointing. He wants us to own our anointing. He wants us to operate in our anointing so let's go back to jesus and let's think about this anointing which is relational purposeful and powerful okay the letter of john which faith read for us a little bit earlier explains the relationship between an anointing of the holy spirit and the way we we operate and the way we receive from God. So if you've got it, can you turn to 1 John 2 and we can look at verses 24 and 27. Okay, a little bit of context here because we were back there in Isaiah and Luke for a moment again and, and even, you know, back in Exodus when I was thinking about the temple, but let the, the tabernacle. But let's look at, at um, 1 John 2.27. 2:27. Now, I'm just going to contextualize this for you. This is the Apostle John, the same writer of the Gospel, and he is uh, writing a letter. It's not a letter like Ephesians or Corinthians to one specific congregation that has then become general. These were letters that he knew and the Holy Spirit told him would go around a lot of people. So that's why in some places they're called the Catholic, which means the general epistles. Okay. And the section of chapter two that these verses i asked faith to read are found um are in a section where john is teaching and encouraging the true believers in jesus how to stay away from bad teaching how to separate themselves from people who he calls antichrists people who are against jesus christ people who set themselves up against jesus and people who want to change the teaching and the key to what he says is the anointing that they the true believers have received he's not talking to one particular congregation in ephesus or rome he's not saying oh i came to you and i put oil on your head and so that will keep you safe no because this isn't about the physical oil this isn't a superstition he's not writing to one particular um congregation at one time he's writing to every believer john through the inspiration of the holy spirit is writing to you jess and you nathan and you jeremy and you faith and you ade he's writing to you to give you this advice all right now listen really carefully i'm going to read from uh, verse 20 a little bit before this key verse but you have an anointing from the holy one and all of you know the truth I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. Who, who's the liar? It's the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is an antichrist. He denies the father and the son. No one who denies the son is the father. Whoever acknowledges the son has the father also. See that you, what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. 
And this is what he has promised us, even eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Okay. Number one. John says that if you believe in Jesus, you have already been anointed. So I want every single believer listening to this to just take a moment and confess that over themselves with their mouth. I am anointed. If you follow Jesus, if you believe in him, if you have given your life to him, you are anointed. Now, there's lots of proof for this in scripture all over. But let me take you to one particular prophecy of Jeremiah that I absolutely love. In Jeremiah 31, uh, which is recapped in Hebrews. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34, Jeremiah prophesies that there will be a time when no longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Jeremiah prophesied that there would come a time when people would be taught by God directly. They wouldn't need to go to a priest or a prophet, but that God himself would teach them. That prophecy was fulfilled in the coming of the Holy Spirit through Jesus to every believer. Because the thing about anointing is, anointing is direct access, direct influence from God upon us. The blood of Jesus has washed away the sin of every believer. Everybody who believes in Jesus has had their sins forgiven and can come to God. But the anointing of God that, that comes from God upon us means that God is able to directly influence us, directly minister through us. It's relational, it's purposeful, it's powerful. What does John mean with all this stuff about truth? How does that relate to what I just read from Jeremiah? Well, John was really concerned that people were getting confused about the truth, but he said, stick to the original teaching, abide in it. He used the word remain in this translation in NIV. That word in Greek in other places translated abide. And it's the same word. You won't be surprised by this in John chapter 14 and 15, 16 and 17, when Jesus prays over and over and over again that we and all believers should remain in him as he remains in the father. John was going back to what Jesus said and said, if you stay close, if you fellowship with, if you abide with, there's another way of thinking about this word. If you tabernacle with takes us back to the anointed temple where God wanted to meet with the people of Israel. If you stay with God nice and close, you will stay in truth. And actually that's very observable because when you spend too long away from scripture, away from the fellowship, away from worship, all sorts of crazy ideas can get in your head. And all sorts of antichrist things can pop up in your own head and you can start giving too much space to people who don't follow Jesus and that's when, tragically, people begin to feel their faith weakening. And they say, where is God? Where is this guy? The medicine for that, very clearly, is for us to abide, to remain in Jesus, to remain in God the Father, to remain in the Holy Spirit, to remain in and be unified with God, which is a unique promise of the Christian faith. No other religion ever teaches this, that we should have unity with the God whom we worship. But Jesus made it an absolute mainstream, 100% universal promise that everybody who believed in him would have unity with God, the Father in heaven, unity with himself as Jesus, and would receive the Holy Spirit, as every one of us who believes in Jesus has. John says you won't need anybody else to teach you. He doesn't mean that if 
you believe in Jesus, you can stuff your ears full of wax and go around saying, oh, I don't listen to Pastor Dave. I don't listen to uh, the teachings of the church. He means the opposite. You have got a direct teacher, somebody who will tell you whether Pastor Dave is teaching well or not, someone who will help you to understand the teaching of your church, someone who will keep you in the proper faith and keep you away from heresy. And that is God himself who will teach you. And I hope that you can put your finger on times when you've heard God speak to you. And if you haven't, or if you can't put your finger on it, today's a very good day to ask God, speak to me today in a way that I recognize. He speaks to all of us in different ways. He speaks to us in different ways at different times. And sometimes he makes us wait. I've had a lot of experience of that recently. But God can and will speak to you directly through your imagination, sometimes through an audible voice, sometimes through other people. And that's what Jeremiah prophesied. That's what John teaches. That's what the anointing represents. The direct pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon a believer's life. Teaching is important. Okay? God's anointing resting on us so that he can show us what to do is important. But it isn't the most important thing. So let me take you back to my trio. My trio. I hope you remember them. The anointing of God is relational. It's purposeful and it's powerful. It's relational. We are not anointed by a force. We're not anointed by electricity. We're not anointed by the wind. It's not something impersonal and, and strange and out of control. Anointing is when God personally takes an interest in us now earlier today we were worshiping and we were led by an anointed family of worshipers and you may be able to recognize that you may have heard other people say that but but once our spiritual eyes are open we get increasingly good at noticing oh they have an anointing for this they steward an anointing for that and some people are very famous for it you might still think of a, a big worldwide uh, known christian like uh, reinhard bunker who might carry an anointing for evangelism with great power and what God is really interested in all cases whether it's an anointing for worship or evangelism or anything else anointing for healing before what that anointing is for before its purpose the first thing is that God is interested in that relationship in being close with the person whom he is anointing God wanted to dwell with the ancient Israelites. So he said, make me a special place and I'll dwell there. I'll stay there. You can come to me. It'll be regular. I won't leave you. It was called the tabernacle. And Moses anointed it with special oil. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, all you who are weary. My burden is easy. My yoke is light. He was saying, come and, and be with me. And he wants to be with us as well he wants to be with us in that relational way he said in john 14 and 15 and 16 his, his great teaching about unity he said anybody who who um who asks me and my father and i will make our home in him he actually says i, I want you to 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 have a, a family me the, the heavenly father god of all you your family, your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister. I want us to be entwined like that, says Jesus. I want us to be together. And that has got in itself no purpose other than the pure joy of being unified together. The anointing oil is meant to be an oil of unity and an oil of joy. This is found throughout the Psalms and the Prophets. But Psalm 133 specifically says uh, about the, the unity that comes. So I'll just read that very quickly. This is a very short psalm. Psalm 133 reads, How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robes, as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. God wants to pour out unity when he pours out anointing. Anointing is not intended to divide people. 
It's intended to bring people together. If we observe another believer operating in their anointing, it shouldn't be bringing up envy. We should be receiving from it. And if it does bring up envy, then we have to take that to the Lord. If we see that somebody else has got anointing for teaching or music, I think that feeling that comes up going, oh, well, what about me? I think that feeling is a valid one. But instead of going, what about me? It's not fair. We really need to be taking that, what about me? And taking it to the Lord and saying, what's my anointing, Lord? What do you want to do through me? Because anointing is relational. God wants to anoint you and be present with you in your life. Okay, Benita, I could see you up there. Benita, the Lord wants to be present in your life even more than he is now. He wants to drench you with his oil. But he's also got a purpose for you and for each one of us. Now, Jesus' example in Luke 4 is perfect. Jesus is always the perfect example. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. He was a very tidy teacher. He left no loose ends. When Jesus read out from the scroll of Isaiah, his anointing, I'm sure you remember it, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Jesus' anointing that he was specifically fulfilling was to preach the good news of salvation to the poor and to the spiritually poor. He was saying, this is what I am called to do. And that, in a way, is a covering anointing for so many things. Because Jesus was anointed to heal. He was anointed to teach. He was anointed to work miracles. But he also said to his disciples that they and the people following would do even greater things than he'd had chance to do. And Jesus only ministered for a very few short years. Whereas we've observed people who've had lived lives of ministry that have stretched well up into their 80s and 90s, who have worked incredible wonders by the time of their, their going to the Lord. They just had a lot more time than Jesus did. That's amazing to say. But that cover all ministry of preaching the good news to the poor is the anointing under which we want as a church to operate. We want to say that's our anointing that's our calling and then inside it i believe the holy spirit is going to challenge you individually everybody listening whether you're a full-time member of our congregation or not he's going to challenge you to fully discover and own your anointing of god and i've been experiencing this in the last week i've had a lot of difficulty with my schoolwork and teaching i had even difficulty with theodora as a as a father and being able to be a good father with her and i realized that's because the lord has made it unavoidable while preparing for this teaching that i grapple with what is my anointing and like i said this isn't about us looking at one another in envy it's about us being unified in saying we're all working and if i start talking like that it might start popping into your head well this sounds like the gifts of the spirit. This sounds like the body, the body anointing with one body and many parts. It is. It absolutely is. The anointing, the crise, to use the Greek word, the presence of the Holy Spirit is expressed through the gifts, the charisma. The crise and the charisma are essentially the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The anointing covers everything and is what we must operate under. And the gift is the way that we do that. And we all have many gifts. There'll be teaching to come on that. And I know that as the, as the leaders are talking over this, we want to continue exploring anointing. So today can't be fully in depth. There's lots more things I'd love to talk to you and, and, and explain to you that the Lord has shown to me. But I believe that the Lord is pulling the most important things to the fore. And I'm coming back to, a few, to those three points that I haven't particularly explained well. That it's relational. God wants to be with us by anointing us with his Holy Spirit. And he has anointed each one of us who believes in him by his Holy Spirit. And secondly, that there's a purpose. This purpose is to show and, um, and, and kind of demonstrate the good news of salvation. That is the, the purpose of God's anointing. If one of you has got a specific anointing within that, that is a gift. I mean, we could look at the way that Nathan just, just directed and led his family and say he's got a, an anointing of music, but also an anointing of direction. We could observe that. There's a purpose for that. It's to bring order into the house. It's to bring unity and it's to bring joy. We, we really enjoyed, I'm sure you did, I did, the time of worship we had together. That's a good example. But there's a power as well. There's an absolute, there's a power 
that that God wants to pour out. And this is the final thing I, wa I want to really get across that I think is very important for us. And I'm going to need Theodore in a minute to, to illustrate this to you. When we observe somebody working in what we would call anointed power, sometimes, you know, say it with inverted commas or hushed tone, somebody who can work miracles, somebody who can reliably minister the healing of God, not somebody who goes, oh, wow, yes, I mean, the Lord worked through me once, but somebody who knows and understands that God works healing through them and so is confident to say, you're unwell, come here, let me pray for you. And I've come across a few people like that in my life. But I think that it's something that many of us want to grow in. We might recognize our anointing, but we might not fully receive the power of it. The degree to which we remain in unity with Jesus is the degree to which we experience the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The more we stay close to Jesus, our Saviour, and to God, our Father, who loves us, the closer we remain and the longer we remain close, the more he ministers through us. That means that it's not our purpose to go looking after miracles and go, oh, I want to be doing this. Our, our direction in Jesus should be to look for a way to stay as close to Jesus as we can. Here's my teaching tool for this. Jesus said that the little children should come to him and that to be born again we have to be like little children. Uh, but I, I really realise that little children is, is a bad translation. The word there means an infant. It means not a child who kind of is walking around by themselves, not a child who is, uh, is able to live much by themselves, but somebody who is utterly dependent upon their parent. Now, Teodora can't walk yet. She's dependent upon Cheryl and myself to pick her up and move her from here to there. And okay, Suze says this is sweet. Suze, don't get distracted by the baby from the important theological point here. This is this is an impartation I'm giving you, okay? Teodora can't walk. Teodora can't really even eat, or let alone cook for herself yet. I mean, I'm looking forward to her cooking me dinner, but it doesn't happen yet, okay? She needs me to do that for her. So, her purpose, this is quite observable, is to stay close to me and to stay close to her mummy. She does what she can to stay close to us because she knows that if she doesn't stay close to us, she can't eat. She can't walk. She can't go anywhere. She can't even clean herself. Just let that sit in your spirit for a moment. If Teodora doesn't stay close to me, she can't even clean herself. Now, if we don't stay close to Jesus, what sort of state are we in? We can't do a thing, okay? And she, she needs me to feed her. When, when um, Jesus said, remain in me, and thinking back to what he taught about being like a little child, we can dress up that remain in me in like difficult ways. Oh, that means I have to do Bible study every morning at five o'clock for an hour and a half. Because if I don't do that, I'm not staying in Jesus and there won't ever be any power through me. And, 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 and I'll lose my faith and give it a break. What we really need to do is have the attitude of an infant who looks to Jesus constantly. You will feed me. You will help me to walk. I think that the Spirit of God is encouraging us to read our scripture in a different way. Not to read it thinking, at the moment I'm saying, I think there's a specific um, move from the Lord. Not just to read it going, I want to understand more, but to read it like Theodora is learning to talk. Now, Theodora can't talk properly yet. She gavels and she babbles. So what she does is she stays close to me and she stays close to Cheryl and she mimics us and she's really been doing it a lot in the last couple of weeks she mimics us in in all sorts of hilarious ways sometimes with incredible clarity and you turn around and go did, did you just say that did you say hallelujah uh, did you say hello goodbye and and she'll she'll mimic anything she's put by she'll even mimic the teletubbies if we leave that on the tv shouldn't that be how we behave with the word of god shouldn't we be mimicking our father's voice 
it doesn't really matter if we don't fully understand what he says. There's something very real about staying close to God and reading scripture aloud and getting this to be the voice that we hear most often and this to be the voice that we speak out of. Theodore is learning all sorts of intonations that I recognise as being her mum's and mine. Are we speaking in ways that remind people of Jesus? We should be. And that's not a uh, that's not meant to, to be a condemnation that's meant to be a, a point to provoke us if we're going to be like little children we have to remain in Jesus we have to remain in the father we have to abide there isn't really a good English word for this and the closest I've got recently is thinking about how Theodora needs to be close to me and that really is also the place of anointing. If I go back to John briefly, I think I feel like I need to finish this up now. If I go back to First John, John was teaching that if people wanted to stay in truth, not fall into heresy, and to stay close to what uh, God's intention for them was, then they needed to remain. That's where the verse 27 finished. Just it, as it has taught you, remain in him. And this is where uh, scripture as written in English is confusing. As it has remained, it has taught you, remain in him. It refers to the anointing. But we know the anointing is the person of God in the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit has taught you, remain. If the Holy Spirit has taught you something recently, don't go, oh, that was good, Holy Spirit. Remain in it. Repeat it. Repeat it aloud. Write it down. Think about it. Stay close. Mimic what the Holy Spirit has said until what comes out of your mouth is more true to what he says than what your mind says. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If you're a young believer, if you're a, a member of our youth, if you are somebody who's come to faith recently, think about what you've been taught and don't let it become a secondary influence. Let that become the main influence. The gospel of Jesus Christ, that if you believe in Jesus and repent of your sins, you will be saved and he will give you eternal life. That is something to repeat and speak over yourself and write on the wall of your house, as long as you've got your parents' permission, as often as you can. I mean, now here's an example. We see Josiah lift up her signs of salvation. She writes out the truths of scripture and that's a good example for us. That is one way of remaining in the anointing, remaining in the spirit. This is really another teaching, how to remain in God. And I, I believe that God will, will ask somebody else within our congregation to talk specifically about it. But this is going to be key to us fulfilling our vision. There's no way that we can minister and preach the good news to the poor if we don't remain in him remain in the one who has anointed us to do it so that means that there's the relationship between us and god our father must be so close that is again what jesus showed us so let's look at jesus and see how he had a relationship with his father we can talk about that another time now there's a purpose to it we recognize it and as you understand the purpose of the things of the ways you're anointed you will grow in your anointing because you are anointed and then you will experience more and more of god's power and that isn't necessarily the big flashy stuff like miracles. But you'll come to know what I mean. You'll absolutely know what I mean. I'm not going to say more now. I want to finish with a prayer. A prayer for all of us and a prayer for myself. And I'm particularly going to pray for anybody who's, who's listening and saying, this is all just gobbledygook to me because you're talking about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And I haven't heard his voice like you're talking about. So I want to invite you if what I've said resonates with you, but you don't know a way in, there is a very simple way in. And that's the name Jesus. Because Jesus' name means God is my saviour. And as soon as we say Jesus and we mean in our heart, God is my saviour, we begin to open ourselves up to him. So I'm going to pray in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Jesus, saviour. I know I need you in my life. I invite you now to come by your Holy Spirit and touch me and make me new. 
I'm sorry, Lord, for doing all the things which have upset you or hurt you, things which are against your law. But I want you to be the first and the last in my life. Lord Jesus, I want to hear your voice and know you and know God my Father through you. Thank you, Lord. And now let's pray for the church together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for River Church and I thank you for your church in England and in the world. A church that you have anointed to preach the good news of salvation to the poor and to the spiritually poor. Thank you, Lord, that each one of us who believes is anointed by your Holy Spirit to have a relationship with you, to bring salvation to the lost and to experience your power in our lives. Thank you, Lord. I pray for us at River Church, Lord. I ask that you would just show us how you want us to carry this great responsibility to show us and to teach us through your word through our pastor through our leaders through our elders through one another as we're examples to one another how to act for you in the world how to stay close to you how to receive the new life that you promise we pray for those lord who are towards the end of their walk and are looking forward to being with you we pray that this time will be a time where they experience more of your power and more of your freedom. I pray, Lord, for those who are young, Lord, in their faith particularly, all members of the youth group, right down to, to Ade and, and even right down to the babies, Lord, Teodora, and, uh, and every single child that you've placed within our family, that the anointing that we recognise on, a, on one another would just be just as strong and just as clear upon them that you would be guiding all of us by your Holy Spirit the greater and the lesser just like you prophesied through Jeremiah and that all of this would bring you glory not that we would enjoy power or success but that your name would be great in the earth and be great in Canning Town and that people would be able to say that Jesus he saves that Jesus he changes lives I'm giving my life to him and I think you should too. That on the most simple terms, that there is a great reputation for Jesus, Lord, in Canning Town and in Newham and in London. That people once again begin to speak your name with awe and wonder about the way you show the power of God and the saving grace of your Father in heaven. Do this, we pray, for your glory. And in your own name we ask it. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Martin. Wow. Wow.